Seuraavaksi meillä on Ruotsista Imri Tarkvist, joka kertoo meille, miten Ruotsista on tullut sellainen monikulttuurin absurdistan, joka se on nyt. Let's give a warm welcome to Imri Tarkvist. Everybody. Before I begin my speech, I just want to say I'm so happy to be here and I'm so grateful to Harry who invited me and he came and um, picked me up with my friend Conrad, my colleague, whom I do a radio pod with and he picked us up at the airport and you know we have been sort of sending some emails but Harry is very short, he just write one line, would you come to Finland and speak? Question mark. And I said, okay, who are you? It's me and my friends. You're not an organization, no, nope. me and my friends. And today I asked him, who are you really no organization? Is it just you and your friends? And he said, Ingrid, I was lying. It was only me. But if I told you that, you would say he's a creepy guy. But now I have friends. <laughs> so now you are here. So thank you so much, Harry. I'm really glad to be here. Dear, dear friends in Finland, as you probably already know, I have come to talk about Sweden, or Absurdistan, as I, called my, as I call my beloved country. But most of all, I have come here to warn you, you, the Finnish people, must do everything in your power to stop Finland, Finland from going down the road to destruction that Swedish politicians chose so many years ago and the consequences of which we see we now see the magnitude of you still have a chance to save finland but you must act now and let people know how bad things are in sweden few swedes were aware of what the parliament decided unanimously in 1975 and I'm sure, pretty sure, that so were the MPs who voted for it. It is kind of complicated to explain how Swedish politicians could decide that Sweden was not going to be a Swedish country anymore, but a multicultural one. But I will do my best to explain what I think happened. First, a bit of background. Up until the 1960s, Sweden had one of the most homogenous populations in the world. Don't believe the people who tell you that Sweden has always been a country of immigration. That's simply not true. They talk about the Walloons who came in the 17th century. But let me tell you how many they were. 900 individuals. And they were highly qualified and soon um, assimilated into the Swedish way of living. Compare that to over 160,000 asylum seekers that came only last year. Many of them illiterate or with only a few years of education. And even those who have the higher education have big difficulties getting a job. It takes time to learn the Swedish language and understand the system. Immigration to Sweden started for real after World War II. Our um, industry was booming and we needed a workforce. So in the 1950s we invited people from other countries to come and work in Sweden. And quite a few did. Mostly they came from Finland and the rest of the Nordic uh, countries, but uh, also from Southern Europe. It worked fine. They had jobs from the first day they arrived. They learned how to speak Swedish and assimilated well into our society. After one generation, you could not really distinguish them from the Swedes other than by their non-Swedish surnames. Very few came from outside Europe. 
But in the late 60s, the union started to get worried that the Swedish workforce would suffer. So 1969 to 1970, there was actually a temporary halt on immigration. But then something very strange happened. In the uh, early 70s, the refugee migration started, and soon a lot of problems emerged. Authorities and others who met these immigrants from the third world, they noticed that they did not assimilate like the Europeans had done. And they had big problems adjusting to the Swedish society. So the parliament decided to look into the matter. The parliament appointed the so-called Invandrarutredningen, the immigration, the immigration, the immigrant investigation. This investigation noted that about half a million inhabitants of Sweden at that time were born in another country. Half a million, that may sound a lot, but half of those immigrants came from the Nordic countries. If you don't count the US and Canada, only 30,000 people in Sweden at that time came from countries outside Europe. That constituted one third of a percent of the total population in Sweden. One third of a percent. Now there are at least 10 percent. It's hard to say exactly how many they are since Sweden tries to hide these kind of figures. Finland is still the number one country among those born abroad. But in second place comes Iraq. Invandrarutredningen came to the conclusion that non-European immigrants had big problems to assimilate in Sweden. One might think that the politicians should therefore have realized that immigration from Europe and other Western countries worked really well, but that immigration from outside Europe did not work and hence was bad for Sweden. They did the opposite. In 1975, our parliament, Riksdagen, decided that from now on, Sweden should not be a Swedish country anymore, but a multicultural one. They decided that children who did not speak Swedish in their homes should concentrate on learning the language their parents spoke, rather than getting extra lessons in Swedish. It was decided that immigrants should be encouraged to keep their own culture, rather than learning the Swedish culture, values and traditions. They decided that everyone living in Sweden should have the same benefits, even though a lot of immigrants never paid one krona in tax. And finally, it was decided that Swedes would have to accept the multicultural Sweden and learn to adjust to it. You might know that the former leader of the Social Democratic Party, Mona Salin, once said, the Swedes will have to adjust to the new Sweden. The old Sweden is never coming back. Between 1980 and 2013, more than 1.7 million people got permanent residency in Sweden according to figures from Migrationsverket. As we have taken in even more since then, it must be close to 2 million people now. In a country with a total population of 9.7 million, I'm sure you all understand what this has done to our society. Rape and other crimes have skyrocketed, but the mainstream media never reports on that. On the contrary, they keep telling us that Sweden has never been as safe and sound as it is right now. People from abroad always ask me how we could let it happen. If the Swedes did not want to live in a multicultural pandemonium, why did we vote for exactly that? I have thought a lot about this paradox and have come up with two explanations. One, the Swedes did not know about the decision made in 1975. There was never any debate 
since all the parties agreed on it. And things did not change overnight. Up until a few years ago, most Swedes had no idea what was going on in the mostly Muslim suburbs of the big cities. Two, Sweden has a very special kind of nationalism that works like this. Since we know that Sweden is the best country in the world, and everybody envies us and would like to become Swedes, we don't have to go around waving our flags and singing our national hymn on a daily basis. So we believed that everything would work out just fine. The immigrants would soon find out that the Swedish way is the best way. So who cared if they had different surnames? And I assure you that none of us ever imagined that immigration would be so big that we will become a minority in our own country in only 10 years if this goes on like this. In the last few years, more and more of us have found out what Muslim mass immigration means to a once peaceful and homogenous uh, society. Last year, more than 160,000 asylum seekers arrived in Sweden. So there is hardly any city or village that is free from asylum accommodations now. Many Swedes have experienced their daughters being raped, their sons being robbed and beaten up, and many of us are hiding behind locked doors with alarm systems. The Swedes have also noticed that they don't get much for all their tax money. We still have one of the highest taxes in the world, even though the former government lowered them somewhat. But the big difference is that we don't get anything back nowadays. The Swedish school have gone from one of the best among the OECD countries to one of the worst. We have fewer hospital beds than any other country in Europe, and the cutbacks are ongoing. Older people's pensions are so low they can't live off them, and they don't get the care they are entitled to. I could go on and on with examples of how the Swedish welfare has deteriorated. So where does all the money go? Well, you don't have to be Einstein to figure that out. There are no official figures on how much the mass immigration costs, but the assistant professor Jan Tulberg from Handelshögskolan, School of Economics in Stockholm, wrote in his book Låsningen a few years ago that it probably costs us 250 billion kroner per year. That's about 25 billion euro every year. Tulberg makes it very clear that the argument the politicians use to make us accept mass immigration, that since we don't have enough children, we need, we need immigrants to pay our pensions, is a fat lie. It all works like the famous pyramid schemes, you know, where everybody wins as long as new participants join the game. I can tell you that compared to the Swedish government, the infamous American swindler Bernie Madoff is a small trader. In Malmo, the city where I lived for 25 years, the Swedes are already a minority. Last year, I could not stand the aggressive atmosphere in Malmo anymore, so I moved away from a once lovely city. And I hear more and more of my countrymen talking about leaving Sweden, and that's not an easy thing for Swedes who have always believed that they lived in the best country in the world. But where can we go? Just a few weeks ago, me and my uh, uh, colleague Conrad went to Åland to find out if that could be a good place for Swedes who want to flee the multiculturalism. We found a society that reminded us of Sweden 20 or 30 years ago. Everybody said that the best thing about Åland is the security. But to our horror, we understood that Åland could be on its way towards a Swedish disaster. 
Politicians there want to open up asylum accommodations and become as humanitarian as Sweden. Please, don't let that happen. Orland is the only other place in the world where everybody speaks Swedish. We might need to come there real soon as refugees. <laughs> but it is not an easy thing to make people understand how quickly you can lose your country, not until they have experienced it themselves, and then it might be too late. I've been trying to enlighten the Swedes about the horrible consequences of mass immigration and Islamization for quite a few years now. For that, I have been called all the bad names in the book. Racist, xenophobe, Islamophobe, and I gave up my career in the mainstream media to be able to tell the truth. I have shown statistics and figures, but people have refused to listen most people don't want to know the bad stuff. They just want to go on with their lives and pretend everything is good. Therefore, I have come to the conclusion that we need to start talking about feelings. Like the leftist liberals have done for so many years. But not the fake feelings of loving the whole world and feeling guilty just because your skin is white or you were born in a European country? That's the kind of fake feelings the left want you to walk around with so that they can take your country away from you while you're all busy feeling guilty. We, who don't want any more mass immigration and Islamization of our countries, we seldom talk about feelings. We talk about crime statistics, about how much money the immigration costs, the taxpayers, the lack of housing, the cutbacks in schools, in health care, care for the elderly, and so on. And that is all true and important, but figures are never as powerful as feelings. I think that's why we, in spite of all the important things we say, have not yet attracted the mass audience we deserve. People care more about feelings than statistics and money, that's just how human beings work. So, I want you all to think about how it feels to live in Scandinavia or the Nordic countries in these days. How does it feel to see people in your country wearing pajamas and hijab and even niqab? How does it feel to see these people look at you with disgust and superiority? convinced that one day they will take over and force you to either convert to Islam, live like a third-class citizen, a dhimmi, or die. How does it feel to see your old mother and father suddenly being poor because their pensions are being cut every year? How does it feel to see your kids fail in school because the school is in chaos and even the brightest kids have problems learning something in this environment? How does it feel to think about the life your children and grandchildren will have when there is no more democracy, free speech, and all the other things we and our forefathers created? I will tell you how I feel. I feel like someone who is forced in a marriage. My parents, the government, forced me to live with a man, the mass immigration, who treats me badly, hits me and rapes me. And if I complain, I am told not to be so racist. I am told that I had a too good a life before, a life that I didn't really deserve. So now I must give something away to the more unfortunate guys and do so with a smile. Dear friends, I don't want to be in this forced marriage anymore. I want a divorce, and I want my abusive husband to go away. I want to once again be able to go to the public swimming pool without being groped by men who believe that women in bikinis are fair game. 
I want to once again feel safe in the streets of my hometown. I want the schools to be good again, the hospitals to be great again, and I want to know that my old parents will be able to live on their pension. I want to live a free and happy life in the country where I was born with people who love this country and would do anything to protect it from going down. These people don't have to be born in my country. They don't have to be blonde and blue-eyed. But they need to love my country and be prepared to sacrifice everything for her survival. I want to feel safe. I want to know that my neighbors will protect me, that my fellow countrymen will go to war if necessary to protect us from the caliphate. My country is Sweden and your country is Finland. But I think what I have been telling you is true for every European country. Before our crooked politicians decided to ruin the nation states of Europe, we had a true a thriving multiculturalism. We had French culture, English culture, German culture, Polish culture, Finnish culture, Danish culture, Swedish culture, and so on. If we don't stop the mass immigration to Europe very soon, we will have no multiculturalism left. We will have Islam and nothing else. And you don't need a vivid imagination to figure out how that would feel. So, let's start talking about feelings. Talk to your friends, neighbors, and co-workers about how sad you are, how you worry about the future of your kids, and how deadly scared you become when you think about the Islamization of Europe that is going on every day. I have a feeling many of them will listen and agree, and one day you might hear them say just like you do. I want my country back. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much.